good afternoon and welcome to our overview here of vaccine distribution from the, Mon from the uh, Morris County Chamber of Commerce. It's really a pleasure to welcome all of you. My name is Jim O'Hearn. I uh, represent the HR subcommittee and HR executives council here at the chamber. Um, and vaccines have been a big issue uh, for uh, the HR community, the legal community, and all of us in the workforce. And so this is a really nice opportunity to learn about some best practices. Um, I will introduce the, um, the group um, um, in just a minute, but I want to uh, raise the, um, uh, let's, let's, let's check in with the, the chamber first. Um, Megan, can you give us, Megan Huncher, the CEO of uh, the Morris County Chamber, it's a pleasure to have you with us, Megan. Um, what's, uh, any highlights at the chamber that we should be aware of? Well, first, Jim, I'd like to welcome everyone to our program today. Uh, thank you, Jim, for chairing our Human Resources and Talent Committee along with Karen. Uh, you have brought a tremendous expertise to us today. Um, and I would like to just welcome everyone as the president and CEO of the chamber to our Vaccines in the Workplace seminar. Um, I'm so glad everyone could join us today. At the chamber, we continue to fulfill our mission to educate, facilitate, convene, advocate, and inform now virtually. We've been virtual for almost a year, and we're very proud of being able to have pivoted to our virtual business model. Your success as a business continues to be our mission, and we thank the generous sponsorship of Connell Foley today. Uh, without the sponsorship, we cannot continue to put on these informative programs for our members. We also thank our uh, business cabinet members, one of whom is with, with us today, Summit Medical Group, for their continued support as well of the chamber. Um, and today, we're really glad that we can focus optimistically on the vaccine rollout. We're certainly hopeful that this is the beginning of the end. Uh, we know there are some challenges that our businesses face when returning to work. Of course, we're all eager uh, to meet again in person and to work collaboratively. Um, and we will hear from experts today who will help you businesses navigate these challenges and of professionals who specialize in areas uh, to help your businesses thrive and survive, uh, of course, be as safe as possible during this, this time. Um, I do want to thank you, our chamber community, our business community, for all that you do. Uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we'd like to thank you again for joining us and, of course, to our sponsors and our, and our speakers. Uh, before I turn it over to Jim, I would like to invite everyone to visit our website, marschamber.org, and visit our calendar of events. We have a tremendous amount of events for, for um, every interest. In particular, we have a Women in Business event coming up next week that's talking about a resiliency. It's actually a, a woman who is a childhood a burn victim survivor, and she talked about how she has survived and thrived. And so really apropos for this uh, challenging time that we're going through. So I'll turn it back over you to, uh, to you, Jim. Thank you. I wanna welcome our, our uh, esteemed professionals, uh, executives that are with us today. Um, I wanna start with you, Dr. Uh, Kerry LeBenger, um, the chief clinical immunologist for Summit, Summit Medical and the chief medical officer for Summit Medical and City MD, uh, where you have Dr. 1,800 doctors um, on the team, 200 offices, um, and an amazing practice. Having uh, seen you mentioned 3.5 million COVID patients uh, so far, um, and uh, perhaps you'll correct me there. Um, Karen, we also welcome uh, Karen Stringer, um, one of our legal experts who will be guiding us through some of uh, our, our legal um, uh, uh, guidance to follow, and Mike Shadiak from uh, Connell Foley, one of our, our sponsors today. Thank you, Mike, and we're really looking forward to your guidance. The HR community, along with the entire workforce, has a challenge, um, and let's hear a little bit more about uh, the way we're seeing the challenge. Uh, John Christian, tell us about your role and how this is playing out as a challenge for your firm. Great, thank you, Jim, and good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity. I'm Director of Human Resources for Nisavacha, which is a mid-sized accounting, auditing, and wealth management firm here in Morris County. That's important for framing our issue. We've been back in the office since the end of May, about 40 to 50%, been fairly successful in implementing protocols in the CDC and the state and keeping people relatively healthy and safe. We are now about to enter what we call busy season, 
which is tax season is back at us. We're actually a year, almost exactly a year since this went out last time. So our struggle now is getting people back into the office to handle this. On top of that, we have not been seeing clients for the, this whole time. Clients now are asking to come and meet with our tax professionals and audit professionals. And they're saying to us, hey, I've been vaccinated so I can come in. You know, I'm not a problem. I can come in and do this. So these are some of the struggles that we're facing right now. Thank you, Jim. Great, John. Thank you. Melissa, how about, how about things in your organization? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Melissa Toll from Delta Dental of New Jersey and Connecticut. I am one of the HR directors. And we've also been back in the office since the beginning of May, granted a small percentage, fluctuating anywhere from 8% to 25% of our associates. We're fortunate in that we decided to change renovation plans from a few years in the future to uh, now. So we started renovating the end of October and have a much small, smaller percentage of associates on site. And in addition to making sure that our associates and their families stay safe and stay healthy through all of this, one of our struggles is with the vaccines, not knowing if there's a shortage, when it will be available, um, do we make it mandatory for our associates? But then also the thought of having associates work remotely since March to whenever they all are able to come back on site because of the renovations, how are we going to be able to communicate that we maintained that safe work environment for everybody and allow everybody to continue to come into the office um, and get them to pivot from working remotely to now working into the office again? Thank you, Jim. Great point, Melissa, thank you. Sheldon Wright, Crum and Forrester, tell, what, what, what's your role there, Sheldon? Thanks, Jim, uh, great to be here. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Benefits for Crum and Forrester a national leader in the insurance industry. Um, like the other companies, we're continuing to face the challenges of the ongoing pandemic. Um, and uh, at CNF, we're geographically dispersed workforce. We we're, 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 have 2,400 employees across the nation. That includes 600 here um, in the Morristown headquarters. Um, this creates some unique challenges for us. Um, we've obviously got COVID infection rates varying by location. We've got state policies governing business operations and safety protocols that differ uh, by state. And now, of course, the vaccine availability and the vaccination protocols are different in every state. Um, faced with those obstacles, we continue to be 100% um, a remote workforce right now. Um, and um, really, you know, that causes some other concerns or difficulties for us. Um, uh, after 11 months, what we hear is people are, people are really uh, fatigued by the lack of human uh, interaction. They're anxious to get back to work once again and meet face-to-face -face and collaborate in person. Uh, so like the rest of us here today, we're looking forward to hearing from the experts on, on how we can best educate, encourage our employees, remove barriers for them during this uh, vaccination phase of the pandemic. Excellent, Sheldon. Great, thanks so much. Dr. LeBenger with thousands of employees in New Jersey and New York, uh, many healthcare workers uh, who have uh, been vaccinated perhaps, um, you may be a little bit ahead of us. Um, we really look forward to learning uh, from you what insights you're gaining around uh, the distribution of the vaccine with your workforce. Um, thank you so much for taking some time to join us, and we look forward to hearing how you've managed your vaccine distribution. Sure. Thank you very much for having me. I'm going to uh, share my slides right now. This is what happens when you're uh, in the... Uh, oh, i got to go back one. Perfect. Uh, yeah, no, it's perfect. It, it's being, although it was 50 some odd years ago, being in the AV squad does help. Okay. So listening to everybody uh, online and their problems, uh, I think I could tailor this conversation a little bit uh, more narrow to what we, we need to do. So let's just take an overview of what the problems really are and how we're solving them, and they will be solved. And let me just say first, we're on the decline right now. Uh, let me go to my first slide and, and, and say the keynote point of today's meeting is the following. The most successful disease to treat is the one that you never get. And that is the hallmark of American and actually medicine in the 20th and the 21st century. 
immunizations. Many of you have children um, uh, who are growing, growing up now in school, some have them grown. The measles uh, uh, was an epidemic at one point and with the exception of that little blur about a year ago, it's pretty much gone. In my generation, I'm, I'm a senior citizen. If I took off my shirt and I won't do it now, you would see my escar from the smallpox vaccination that we all got. There is no more. There was not even a reported case of smallpox in the world. So vaccinations do work. It's needed to be done. The question is, this is a relatively new vaccine. It came out relatively quickly. How do you address the concerns, especially within a disease that the vast majority of people who get it are either asymptomatic or have mild disease? You do see the horror stories on TV and we're not gonna, whether it's 500,000 deaths or one death, if it's somebody that you love, it's 100%. So we're gonna look today at how we looked at it in the medical community. And yes, Jim, you're right. Summit City MD saw three and a half million uh, cases. In the beginning, the first one or two million were mostly sick people in our offices all over the boroughs, the counties around New York. Uh, we were the first to have uh, point of care testing and we had PCR platforms uh, in-house in that we were running it uh, uh, very, very quickly. Uh, so let's look and let's go down to how we could help everybody in the workplace today. So right now, there are two vaccines. And I'm gonna talk a little bit, and we're gonna to have to go back to a little bit of high school biology and how they work. And there's one that's about to come out probably in two to three weeks. These are what's called messenger RNA vaccines. People say, oh, wow, you know, this is just new technology. I'm not used to it. I'm, I'm kind of concerned about it. Let's look at an analogy. In 1860, to go cross country, it took you a year by covered wagon before the railroad started. In 1960, it took you five hours. The, all the years, and some of you know this because a lot of the um, uh, biotech industry is in the Morris uh, corridor, has exponentially grown to the point where it is not unusual to develop a vaccine in such a short period of time. As a matter of fact, the two companies were working on other vaccines with this technology. In early January, when they knew that this was going to be an issue, the NIH was able to get the genetic sequence of the, in Wuhan, of the coronavirus. Now remember, coronaviruses are not unusual. There are four human ones. There are three unusual ones. They went by SARS, MERS, and now COVID-19. They took that and they were able to make messenger RNA from that. They were able to code it in a lipid, pro a lipid layer. And because messenger RNA is very fragile, that lipid layer had to be frozen. It goes through the cell with the injection into a muscle cell where it breaks apart and it uses, and here's the word from high school, ribosomes to make spike protein. Spike protein is that little crown on the uh, corona surface. And then that stimulates an immune response to make spike protein antibodies and stimulate other cells such as T cells to produce chemicals that can kill the virus. And that's why this particular vaccine, the Moderna and, and the uh, Pfizer, and Johnson Johnson is very similar, although it uses an older method of slipping DNA into the cell, produces such a robust response. Just to give you some idea, these are about 95 to 97% effective, whereas flu vaccines are at most 40 or 50%, maybe 60% effective. The problems and the challenges with the vaccine or there are two dose schedule, the ones that are available. The one that's gonna come out probably in two weeks is a one dose. That's the um, Johnson & Johnson made by Janssen uh, with it. And it has to have very special um, uh, uh, ways of, of keeping it. It has to be frozen. And then when it's defrosted, it only has a certain half-life. When you puncture the vial, it's only good for six hours. So you have to count out the amount of doses that you're given, and then you have to toss it. The Johnson & Johnson is gonna be more like a flu vaccine the vial can last for months in the refrigerator. And not only that, the vial, once you puncture it, could also stay for weeks. So it's, it's more likely what you do in a doctor's office. The other ones really have to be done in a dedicated vaccine clinic. But here's the good news. The, 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 the two vaccines that are out are virtually 95% effective in preventing the disease, but 100% effective in preventing severe disease even after one dose. So here's the big question that everybody has, should people get one dose? And if they get one dose and you have enough to double up on the people, you won't be able, nobody maybe will stop the carnage that we're seeing on TV every night. Or do you give 
two doses. Now, if you give the two doses and the person can't replicate the virus, you don't get the mutations. So this is some of the things that people are going through. But for our, our knowledge right now, the, the, the good news is the vaccines are extremely effective. And when we get them into everybody's arm, we are going to end the pandemic. And that's the great news. And here you can see, we're gonna talk about some of the safety, how they were tested. And there's yours truly giving uh, his brother, who's the CEO of Summit City MD, uh, the first vaccine. He's a practicing surgeon in our vaccine clinic. So how safe is it? The one good news, the one good news is that, and I have personally know some of them as I'm an immunologist, the people on the vaccine committee on the NIH and on, on the FDA, and they will never cut a corner. They weren't. They're the ultimate scientists. They're not political uh, uh, people of any way. When they did design the vaccines, uh, Moderna was helped with the NIH. Uh, Pfizer did it alone. They included a vast majority of, 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 of the population. It was almost indicative or representative of the population at large in terms of uh, communities of color, Hispanic, and age uh, rate ranges with it. When we looked at and we're seeing this now, it is extremely safe. Everybody was worried about the anaphylaxis. It is, you have a better chance literally of winning a uh, lotto or mega millions than having an anaphylactic reaction. It's one in 200,000, approximately one in 100 people will have a severe allergic reaction in their life. So even if you have a severe allergic reaction, it's one in 2000 that you'll even have the anaphylaxis. Um, and it is a very, very robust uh, vaccine and people do get a little bit of side effects. And we're gonna talk about that in a few seconds. So no matter how safe it is and how much we're gonna give it, the first question I heard is, do we still have to wear masks and still have to socially distance? And that's probably yes for a period of time. The data that's coming out and just was released from Israel today that when they gave the uh, one of the vaccines, it was the Pfizer vaccine, that's what Israel's getting, they reduced transmission asymptomatically significantly because the viral load, even those people who didn't get sick had such a low amount of virus in their system, if they would have contacted, they, they weren't able to spread it as much. But the first question is, yes, you're still gonna have to have a very safe workplace. Why is this a problem? Probably because 30 million Americans as of today probably have had the disease. But when you look at actual numbers, it's closer to 75 million. And that's interesting because if 75 million people have had it and approximately 10% of the population has had at least one dose, we're really approaching herd immunity. And in a couple more months, we're gonna get to that, what's called the 70th, 70 percentile. What herd immunity is, is that the herd, you know, you have a cow in the middle of the herd, the wolves can't get it because the rest of the herd is protecting them, even if you didn't get the vaccine. So there, it's a problem. There are gonna be between four and 500,000 deaths as, as people are watching this. And when I said before, it doesn't matter if it's one person or 500,000, if it's somebody you love or somebody you're close to or somebody you know, it's virtually a percentage of 100%. And we're gonna to have to deal with them. We're dealing with it now what we call the long haulers, and those are people who may have some cardiac and pulmonary issues. The good news, as I said it before, is that it works incredibly. We have an incredible vaccine, and people are worried about the new mutations, the one in South Africa, the one in England, and it appears, it appears, although you need to do what's called field studies to see if, if this is accurate, that there is going to be, and there is, um, uh, efficacy against the, 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 the UK strain, and there appears to be significant efficacy against the South African strain. And the people who develop these uh, vaccines, these are some of the most brilliant people in the world. And they knew that every virus mutates, and that's why they went to the spike protein, and they looked at the genetic sequences to do something that would be as effective as possible. So what's happened with the rollout? Well, I think what happened is the previous administration did not have a policy. I think we'll all agree on that. They said, we're going to make the vaccine and we'll let the states have the policy. And unfortunately, each state was a little bit different. In our state, which is the state of New Jersey, we have 9 million in our population. And when the governor allowed and followed some of the CDC guidelines, he did not make this up. He followed the guidelines that he took the patients who were in 1A, which was the healthcare workers, 1B, which were um, uh, people uh, 75 and above and people who are uh, critical to the infrastructure, and then 1C with people with other 
uh, pre-existing conditions, when you lump them all together, that left to 4 million people who were eligible when the state was only getting 100,000 vaccines at a time, and that's where the mismatch occurred. But right now, we're starting to catch up. Uh, 9 million people have gotten the full uh, two doses. Um, about 3% have gotten, uh, are immunized. And two weeks after the immunization, you probably have reaching the most robust antibody response going forward. The new administration has a little bit more robust plan to do it, the 100 million doses in, in um, uh, a day, excuse me, a million doses a day in each arm, I mean, in an arm is the way what we're trying to do it. And with that, that would probably mean that in the state of New Jersey, we're going to try to get to about 200,000 a, a week. Uh, and that probably is just a few weeks off, and we're doing at least 100,000 a week. So the criteria are right now are, are broad. Uh, it's probably going to affect half your workforce uh, right now. The other ones, the, the uh, uh, phase B, uh, uh, two or the um, or category two are usually just the other healthy people in the environment. And you're going to have to be patient, but by probably by the late spring or early summer, there will be a vaccine for everybody. So why was it this the case? It, it's really a business model and, it's, and a, a medical model. We didn't know when they started uh, doing the research in January whose vaccine was going to be uh, as effective. So the government and, and the person who ran the vaccine uh, it was somebody very well known, Dr. Swawi, who's uh, Monsef, who ran vaccines for GSK. They went to five different companies. They went to Pfizer, Moderna, uh, AstraZeneca, uh, 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 Johnson & Johnson, and Novavax, and they bought 100 million vaccines to be delivered to the government. And that's going to be the second issue. You can't control the vaccine. The, the private industry can't. It is a federally owned vaccine given to the states for distribution. And right now we've seen, and I've said it before, uh, New Jersey is doing well. They're on target. Uh, ever, almost 70 to 80% of every the vaccines that roll in are put into an arm by the end of that week. Okay, what are the concerns? So we just said there's a problem with the supply chain. We're gonna fix that. That's gonna be an easy fix and it's gonna catch up over the spring going forward. And right now we're also starting to see a decrease in the amount of uh, the, the transmission rate is below 0.9 in New Jersey. That's fabulous. The percentage or the positive is going below 9%. That's fabulous. But how do we take the skeptics? Remember, this vaccine was produced quickly. All right. It's relative to the new technology. So of only 60% of the population said that they receive a vaccine. But when you really cone that down, um, a lot, about a half of those, uh, would say that they would see the vac they get the vaccine after it's been out for a little while. The good news is it's that's probably what's going to have to happen because of the supply chain uh, with it. And we need to get at least 70 to 80 percent of our population immunized so that we can get back to the real world. Are there side effects? Does it work? How much does it cost? So here's the good news. It's free. Whether you have insurance or not, it is free. We showed you, I went before how it works. It works by the science that we spent billions and billions of dollars over the last decade to, to work on. Is it safe? It's a very safe. When they did the clinical trials, they've had it between the two or three vaccines that are, are out or will be out, do hundreds of thousands, of, at least 100,000 patients in there doing no severe uh, issues with the vaccine. But once again, the data is only for a few uh, months because remember, the vaccine the works on it started in the early spring. The phase one studies, which are more of an animal model, the phase two, which were over the late spring, which was uh, a very small group of people. And then the larger studies, which were field studies, occurred over the summer and into the fall. And remember, at that time, some of it was dropping. So it was a little, you needed a little bit more patience in there to see who was going to be safe. What a field study is, you give people the vaccine, half get the vaccine, half get the placebo, you wear a mask, you socially distance, you go out in society, you do your work, and you see who comes down with it and who doesn't, and you're constantly tested. So uh, is it safe? It appears to be very safe. Are there side effects? Yeah. And the side effects are just what you got when your kids got a tetanus shot. It's a swelling, it's pain, it may be a little bit of a fever, but very, very tolerable, and it, it, it's very, very transient. So could they get it easy? How would, would it allow them to get back to work and school? 
Is it, you know, the healthcare team said, these are all things that are you going to hear in, in the, so let's, let's chat, tackle some of these, these issues. One, um, the, it particularly was bad uh, and very hardly hit with the black and Latino uh, populations. You could say, if, is it social determinants of health? Is it genetic uh, predispositions? And that's being worked on right now, but it doesn't matter what it was, it's just that it, it was. And unfortunately, based on, I think, as human resource managers and executives, you know about the Henrietta Lacks story um, at Johns Hopkins, and that's still in litigation. Uh, Henrietta Lacks was an unfortunate person who died of cervical cancer. Her uh, cell line has been used without the family uh, knowing about it for years uh, to do the pap smears and things like that. The Tuskegee experiment, uh, where they took, um, uh, did an experiment and it was the US Department of, of Public Service, Public Health, in which they uh, had patients who had syphilis, they were given a placebo, which is unconscionable. So there's a lot of skepticism among certain communities. How did we do it? What did we do at the Summit Medical Group? And this is something that I think that um, we all need to do. What we did is that we were, we built up a, a process where our key opinion leaders in, in every field, whether it was a physician, a medical assistant, a nurse, um, uh, uh, a registrar, uh, people from the front room to the back room uh, were able to get immunized early on and spread the word. We also did public service announcements to our employees and we have 8,000 of them. Uh, we have uh, people of color and uh, uh, African-American uh, physicians and, uh, and uh, Latino physicians who are part of their uh, political um, uh, arm in their, in their, in, in their um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Black Physicians of America or the Latino physicians who are our political leaders or our, uh, thought leaders who did public service announcements for our employees and their families to talk about the vaccine and how safe it is and the reason to get it. So what, what was our internal communication plan? We all know what the strategies are. <coughs> and we used it <clears throat> on a lower level with it. We know that there are champions. Uh, Dr. Fauci has been the biggest champion of it. He was first to get the vaccine. Uh, we did short videos, we did email blasts, we did social media, we did blogs and articles, but more importantly, we went to the people who needed it the most and the people who, um, uh, to educate them and to make them the leaders and the champions on how to get it. So, you know, what, what are the strategies? We had um, uh, meetings, we had town halls, we had the scientific community, we had doctors who people trust, um, uh, employees who people trust, and we, we got people to be confident and to people to be comfortable and we were fully transparent with it. We did not make it a mandated uh, issue, although in certain hospital systems, they are starting to do it around the country. Once again, uh, as one of the, um, uh, uh, participants uh, stated before, when you leave it to the states, you have 50 different ways of doing it as opposed to a national um, uh, uh, workflow or uh, national guidelines. So what I would only leave you with is you need to take the lead in your own organization. You need, need to know the culture of your organization. You need to have um, uh, your key opinion leaders, thought leaders, and respected people to get on board. Uh, you have to be transparent. You have to give them the information uh, with it. And there's little things that you can do to make life easier as they need to get vaccines, such as um, you may get some mild to moderate side effects. You may say if you get the vaccine, you get the next day off, which is what I would recommend. Um, and, and once again, to work together with, with your employees to develop the strategy. So I, um, I, I've i talked for my 20 minute allotment. I'll send the, uh, the screen back and uh, I will answer the questions at the end. So once again, just to stop and finish, the hallmark of medicine is vaccinations, is prevention of disease. Um, in the 1600s, it was a mask. It was hand washing and distancing. In 2020, it was the same thing. And now finally, we have a vaccine that's almost 100% or 90% effective, it would be a shame to leave it in the bottle and not in the arm and get back to normal. Thank you very much. Dr. LeBenger, thank you so much for uh, sharing all of what you've done at Summit Medical and CityMD. It's amazing your 
you're way ahead of us. And it's really, as we're concerned about our workforce, it's really good to hear that you've gotten through thousands of people on your team uh, with transparency, with senior executives participating um, and, and other specialists uh, from their, their cultural groups participating in leading this. It's great to hear your story and it, and it helps us with the tensions that we're um, dealing with. But uh, Karen, you've got, Karen Stringer has got, and, and Mike have additional recommendations for us. We still have some what ifs out there. Karen, can you share some of the what ifs and some of your recommendations? Sure, Thanks Jim. For joining. Thank, thank you so much, Jim. So uh, hi everyone, Karen Stringer, I'm a partner at Olander Feldman. It's a boutique law firm in Summit, New Jersey. Uh, thank you so much to the chamber for having me here today. I'm honored to be part of a panel of such esteemed colleagues and peers and um, that was incredibly helpful presentation. So thank you kind of for setting the stage for us as Mike and I kind of now uh, get the baton past us and deal with more uh, issues around workplace and vaccinations. Um, and so just, you know, kind of a caveat, just want to let you know that the views that I'm expressing here today are my own. They're not the views of my firm necessarily. And also, um, while we'll be providing information about employment laws, um, this should be considered just for informational purposes and should not be considered legal advice. And to the extent that you are out there and considering whether or not to implement a particular policy, whether it's mandating or vaccinating the policy, I highly recommend uh, the vaccine, I should say, I highly recommend you speak with your own uh, labor and employment council who can guide you as to a program that works uh, well for your employment situation. All right, so I'm just gonna take a minute and share my screen, hold on. All right, so um, I can actually just go to the second slide. So I'm gonna be, as I said, in addressing some of the employment law issues that are coming up um, with respect to the vaccine. And uh, one of the questions that everyone seems to be asking right now is, uh, as the vaccine is getting rolled out, or can employers mandate that their employees get vaccinated? And the short answer here, actually legal questions, we usually tend to put caveats in everything, but here the answer is pretty clear. The answer is likely yes. Um, back in December, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or EOC issued guidance, leaving room for employers to mandate a vaccine. Uh, while this guidance is not a court order, there's general consensus among employment attorneys that mandating a vaccine is legal, save certain caveats that we're gonna discuss later today. That said, deciding whether to mandate the vaccine, even if it's permissible to do so, that's not an easy decision. Indeed, the more difficult question is going to be whether employers weighing the various pros and cons, including legal and health risks, opt to mandate the vaccine, incentivize it, or stay completely silent. Each decision has its own consequences and will require different policies and procedures and different risk assessments. You know, I will tell you though that since the EOC issued its guidance, there has been a general consensus among uh, employment attorneys that it would be easier and less risky to incentivize rather than mandate the vaccine. And initially, some large companies seem to be following that advice. For example, we saw Dollar General coming out and saying that it would offer its employees four hours of paid leave so that their employees could get the vaccine. But more recently, we have seen some companies um, indicating some desire to mandate the vaccine. We saw a law firm recently announced that it was going to mandate a vaccine for in-office work and for firm-sponsored events. And on January 21st, the United Airlines Chief Executive Officer Scott Irby, Kirby said he favored requiring all employees who work for the company to receive a COVID-9 vaccine. And he said, I recognize it's controversial, but I think it's the, right, it's the right thing to do for United Airlines and for other companies to require the vaccines and to make them mandatory. And interestingly, there's a recent survey on LinkedIn where surprisingly it indicated that about 46% of respondents indicated that they thought their employer should mandicate, mandate the vaccine. Now, of course, this data site might be somewhat skewed as I venture a guess that a lot of the LinkedIn members are white collar uh, employees, so it might not represent the larger working population, um, but it's something to kind of keep in mind. Um, and also, while we're focused on the vaccine today, you're going to want to think carefully about how any vaccine-related policies uh, that you implement dovetail with, for instance, your back-to-work plans, since deciding whether to bring back employees to the office may be tied into whether a large percentage of the population can get vaccinated. So again, let's take a look at your two options here, really, meaning either mandating or, back, or incentivizing the vaccine. 
Uh, and of, of course, again, you again you can choose to remain silent on this. Um, but when your employers are looking for information and comfort, you should recognize that staying silent as to what you know your workplace policy is going to be is also going to come with its own risks and, and potentially cause more concern for some of your employees. So um, we've already discussed the fact that mandating the vaccine will likely be considered legally permissible. In fact, we've seen, you know, in the past this happening with like the H1N1 swine flu, the EOC recommended back then that absent any state or local laws that employers can mandate getting a flu vaccine. However, I wanna note that there are two footnotes to this. First, there's been some question as to whether or not an employer can mandate the vaccine because both vaccines that are available right now, which you just heard, which are the Pfizer and Moderna one, are, um, they're not FDA approved. What they've been done is they're authorized under the FDA's emergency use authorization. You've probably heard an EUA. So that's what happened here. So to give you a little more background on this, you know, an EUA allows the FDA to authorize the use of an un uh, otherwise unapproved new drug in an emergency to treat, diagnose, or prevent a life and threatening disease when there's no other adequate approved alternative. Um, and this is done when there's a significant scientific evidence to say that it's reasonable to believe that this, you know, for in this instance, for instance, a vaccine would be effective. Now, though, when an is a vaccine or other medication is issued under an EUA, one of the things that happens is, and this is pursuant to a statute, you have to give people who are receiving the vaccine information that they have the option to either accept or refuse the vaccine. So on, in some instances, some people have questioned, well, if, if people have to get, um, you know, notification that they may not have to get the vaccine, can an employer actually mandate it? And so here the general consensus is that that is, uh, it might prohibit states or localities from mandating a vaccine, but employers who are in the private sector can likely uh, mandate the vaccine. Although just be aware that there's a potential that if an employee refuses to get a vaccine, there's potential for a wrongful discharge claim against public policy because of that language, because of the way these two uh, vaccines are approved at this, or author, I should say authorized at this point. Um, and then that also brings me to my second kind of footnote on the permissibility of these vaccines. And this is also critical, is that if an employer mandates a vaccine for its employees, it still must permit employees to request a reasonable accommodation if they have a disability or a sincerely held religious belief, practice, or observance under Title VII that prevents the employee from getting the vaccine. So let's take a look at the uh, reasonable accommodation issue first. So the EEOC has taken the position uh, that an employer can have a qualification standard that includes a requirement that an individual not pose a direct threat to the health or safety of individuals in the workplace. So this is gonna include a safety-based qualification such as getting a vaccine. That said, if the vaccine requirement tends to screen out individuals that have a disability, the employer must show that the unvaccinated employee poses a direct threat to the health or safety of the individuals or others that cannot be reduced or eliminated by a reasonable accommodation. Now, one thing to note here is that the employers should be ready to grant reasonable accommodations to women who are pregnant and breastfeeding given the limited clinical data regarding the risks associated with the vaccine for this subset of individuals. Now, the EOC is almost seems to assume that an unvaccinated person is gonna pose a direct threat. However, an employer should still conduct an individualized direct threat assessment this includes considering the duration of the risk, the nature and severity of the potential harm, the likelihood that the potential harm will occur, and the imminence of the potential harm. So this analysis is definitely going to hinge on the nature of the work and who your employees interact with on a regular basis. For instance, if you've got employees working in a healthcare setting um, or somewhere where the risk of infection is very high, the direct threat is fairly obvious and clear. However, for a business that has most of its employees working remotely, say for instance, in telehealth, it's gonna be a difficult or more difficult, I should say, for the employer to show a direct threat. Now, if the employer determines that an unvaccinated employee poses a direct threat to their workforce um, that cannot be reduced to an ac acceptable level, the employer then must determine if there is a reasonable accommodation that can be offered to that employee. In other words, the employer must engage in what's known as the interactive process. That's a, a process that you work out with your employee to determine if there's an accommodation that can be offered to the employee that allows the employee to 
to perform their essential functions and that they can do that without, without it being an undue burden on the employer. So certain things that you might consider, whether the person can work from home or certain social distancing measures can be put into place, such as working in an office with a door closed, that may be sufficient. So only if there's no reasonable accommodation that can be offered, only then can an employee actually be excluded or some you know, action taken against them because of, uh, because of this issue. Now, um, in addition to the... Uh, Dis the addition to disability accommodations, an employer may need to accommodate an employee with a sincerely held religious belief, practice, or observance. Now, the EOC, which enforces Title VII, uses a really broad definition of religion. It goes beyond membership in a church or a belief in God and includes firmly and sincerely held moral or ethical beliefs. So an employer may engage in like a limited inquiry to ascertain whether the reason, reasoning for seeking an accommodation is based in religion or, for example, a personal preference. However, an employer's preconceived notion of what constitutes a religion should not enter the analysis. That said, courts, even in this very jurisdiction, have held that personal pre preferences and views on vaccines do not constitute religious beliefs. Um, and uh, here, an accommodation should be made to any such employee who has these sincerely held religious beliefs uh, to make an accommodation so long as it poses no more than a de minimis cost to the employer. Um, and so, uh, some, and so likely, if you've got a healthcare worker who puts others at risk, they may be mandated to take the vaccine even in light of a strongly held religious belief. It's going to be a far tougher question if you're in other industries where with where risk to high like where there's less risk to high risk individuals. Now, some practical considerations if you choose to mandate the vaccine is you're going to need to develop policies and procedures. You're going to need ways to communicate to staff what those policies and procedures are. You're going to certainly need to train your managers and supervisors on how to recognize accommodation requests and develop internal procedures for handling those requests. And you're also gonna to need to have a process for handling and responding to vaccine exemptions. And you're gonna to wanna to make uh, certain to ensure that any requests are dealt with uniformly. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. Um, so just a few kind of tag along um, questions here that might come up um, if you're choosing, trying to decide whether or not to mandate a vaccine is, um, you know, if you're gonna mandate the vaccine, how can you make sure that your employees have actually gotten vaccinated? Well, the simple answer here is you can ask them for proof, for proof, all right? But you need to be careful because while the EOC has said that asking for proof that an individual has been vaccinated tends not to elicit any kind of disability related uh, you know, answer, follow-up questions certainly might. So for instance, take this example, someone comes in, you ask them, have you been vaccinated? He responds, no, I haven't. Well, the logical next question, if you're band mandating the vaccine is, well, why not? So you can see how very quickly, if you're asking for proof of the vaccine, you can tend to elicit information about a potential disability. For instance, Jane comes into your office, says she hasn't been vaccinated, you ask her why, and now she says, I'm pregnant, okay? So you have to be very careful if you're gonna mandate the vaccine, um, that you're training people properly, that if they're asking for proof of the vaccine, that they're not asking any further follow-up questions beyond that, which might pose some issues for you. Um, similarly, the employer can choose to actually administer the vaccine or coordinate with a you know, contract with a third party to administer the vaccine. Um, and if it does so, then you also have to make sure that any pre-screening questions you know, are job related and consistent with business necessity. Now, lots of times before you give someone a vaccine, you have to ask a couple of medical related questions. So that again, these, this comes into play and you've got to make sure that those questions are squared with that. Um, and also if you're gathering that type of information, you're going to need to make sure that it's kept confidential and separate. Um, so to really to keep things simpler and to avoid these potential concerns, a lot of employers may choose if they choose to mandate a vaccine to mandate it, but not necessarily administer the program or contract with any third party to do it, but just have it mandated. And then the employee, it's up to the employee to get it done wherever they're going to get it done. And then just have the employee come back with proof of having been vaccinated. Um, now we've talked a bit about um, individuals who may be exempt from a vaccine because of a disability related reason or a religion, but what about employees who are just said, look, I'm just, I'm simply afraid to get the vaccine. I'm, I'm scared about the side effects, even though we've just heard great information about um, side effects today, perhaps they weren't sitting in on today's presentation. 
So generally what the idea is, that's not gonna be a sufficient justification. Just being simply afraid is not gonna do the trick. That said, you've gotta be careful because if you wanna, you might, if it's, you're getting to the place where they might be actually requesting an accommodation because it's tied to either a disability, like for instance, like someone actually is pregnant and they're afraid of it, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that, you know, that, that you're clued into that as well. Um, and what about employees who don't want to turn to work? Let's say you don't have a mandated vaccine policy. And so other employers are saying, well, I just don't want to return to work because other people haven't been vaccinated yet. Um, that's generally not going to be a sufficient reason to not return to work. You're going to want to think about the OSHA general duties clause here, but um, that's probably not going to be um, an okay response. Now, if an employer mandates uh, the vaccine, who should pay for it. Well, if the employer is mandating it, the employer should be paying for it. It's likely that the employer um, coverage is going to cover it, but you should, may also want to consider um, and probably should be paying for any time off for getting the vaccine. Um, and then uh, also you might be thinking about, well, what if someone has a severe allergic reaction to the vaccine? You're an employer, you've now, va you've now mandated an employee gets vaccinated, um, and let's say they're in the unfortunate position in, in being in the very low statistical anomaly there of actually having a severe reaction to it. Um, well, you're going to want to keep an eye on any federal laws that might be rolled out on this, but you should also um, be aware that it's likely going to be covered under the employer's workers' compensation plan. Now, kind of one of the, the key risks here in uh, having a mandated uh, program it's really selective enforcement. Um, so if you have a if you have a policy that everyone has to be mandated, you have to be prepared to mandate across the board, right? So if your high level executive comes into your office and says, "Hey, by the way, I really don't want to get this vaccine. I'm a little scared to get it." Well, if your policy is such that you are mandating the vaccine, you have to make him go get the vaccine just like anyone else. Otherwise, you're going to be potentially, you know, facing discrimination or other claims, right? So. And you also have to be careful because as we've just heard as um, you know, there's still a number of people who are afraid to get the vaccine or are indicating they're not gonna wanna get the vaccine. So let's say 40% of your office comes in and tells you you're not gonna, they're not gonna get the vaccine. What do you do with that information now? Do you still enforce the policy? Do you fire 40% of your employees? So um, you're gonna wanna think through some of those things before you mandate the vaccine. Um, and then, so, you know, the other option here that we're talking about and what we're seeing more employers do is actually incentivizing getting the vaccine. Um, and there's kind of less administrative burden on it. There are less potentially legal risk associated with it. So that seems to be the trend um, that is uh, gaining traction here. So if you're thinking about incentivizing the vaccine, we wanna talk a little bit about what kind of incentives employers are offering and what kinds of uh, incentives you might wanna consider offering. Um, those things are usually things like education campaigns. So some employers have had luck in the past with getting, for instance, the flu vaccine rolled out by encouraging uh, their, uh, by having an education plan that encourages their employees to get the vaccine so that they have the information that's necessary. Uh, the education here could be about, you know, the information that we just learned about today. It could be about the rollout, how to get, you know, who's having priority access, where to sign up. You also might want to find out if your employer plan does cover it so that there's no cost to the employee. Um, you might want to find out, you might want to consider giving paid time off so that people can get the vaccine or offering a dress down day or similar perk. Or you can lead from the top up, modeling good behavior by having executives get the vaccine and showing employees that that's, that that's uh, kind of accepted and what is the approach that your executives are going with. And then you also might consider monetary incentives, but on this one, you're gonna be really careful because there have been some questions about whether what kinds of monetary incentives can be given. Um, and some business uh, leaders have actually written into the EOC because there's some question about how it relates to wellness programs and whether or not certain questions can be asked and whether or not the program, if you offer too big of an incentive, whether or not it's not, if it's now become a mandatory program. So we're waiting to see if the EOC issues any guidance on that. But at this point, I'll just say that if you're gonna offer a monetary incentive, it's probably safest for it to be something fairly small, like a $25 gift card, not, not a really large incentive. And also you wanna be careful if you're gonna give a really large incentive, it might signal to your employees that you actually consider the vaccine dangerous. So you also wanna think about what your signal to your employees based on how large that incentive is. Um, so look, ultimately the decision is going to be a business one. Like I said, mandating the vaccine, 
legally permissible, that is most likely the case. Incentivizing it is going to be legally permissible. Um, so you just have to kind of figure out what makes sense for your particular work environment. Um, and then finally, even though it's not vaccine related, just really quickly, because I want to be able to hand this off to Mike, I should note that OSHA has recently um, issued some revised guidance, which it hasn't done since March, of kind of how to keep your workplace safe. So I, you know, urge everyone to kind of check out that OSHA guidance, um, where they give some general guidance as to what to do in the workplace. And it's very possible that OSHA might issue some more emergency standards by March 15th, 2021. Um, which everyone would want to pay really uh, close attention to. And the thought is, is that OSHA might have a little bit more teeth under the Biden administration. We might see some more enforcement action. So just so keep your eye on all those laws as they come down the pike. So sorry about that. I know that was a lot of information for everyone. Um, and with that, I will uh, hand it off to Mike. Sure, that's really, really, really helpful. Uh, Mike? Uh, you have additional, we've got about 10 minutes left, and you've got some uh, really good additional uh, guidelines to share with us. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Jim and Karen. That was terrific information and very, very practical, and I do appreciate you sharing that with us. So my name is Mike Shadiak. I'm a partner at the law firm of Connell Foley and our headquarters in Roseland, New Jersey. I also chair our labor and employment practice group. So what I do all day long is assist employers, folks in your position, in their compliance efforts, especially nowadays as it comes to the vaccine. Um, so a couple slides here that we put together for everybody. And just to dovetail on what Karen said is the direct threat analysis. So you have an employee who's unvaccinated. Are they presenting a direct threat to your workforce? And Karen laid out the factors that the EEOC gives us as employers that we need to consider. Now, if that direct threat cannot be avoided, it cannot be reduced, what are you gonna do with this employee? Are you going to exclude them from the workplace? Well, you can, and that takes two forms. One is if you mandate that everyone get vaccinated and an employee chooses not to be vaccinated, can you then fire that person for not complying, complying with your mandate? Well, there are a lot of legal issues there, but let's just say for purposes of our discussion, the answer to that question is yes. Okay, now let's take that a step further. 50% of your workforce says, I'm not getting the vaccine. You're gonna fire 50% of your workforce? So this kind of goes in the bucket of watch what you wish for. If we're gonna mandate it, then we really have to see it through. And if folks aren't getting it for whatever the reason, uh, what are we gonna do? And if it's not because they have a legitimate basis due to a religious accommodation request or a disability request, but they're just afraid, they just don't wanna do it, are we gonna fire them? So that sort of brings me to what I wanted to talk about is how do we accommodate these individuals and what policies as the employer do we really need to have in place? So one accommodation, and Karen mentioned this earlier, is letting them continue to work from home through a, what we would call telecommuting arrangement. Now, you may say, oh, wait a minute, Mike, our employees have been working from home since March. We know what this is all about. Well, I think a lot of employers were caught off guard. They weren't really prepared for their employees to work from home. They didn't have the necessary policies in place to make sure they can safely and efficiently work from home. And in my experience, some employers still don't have the necessary policies and procedures in place, even though it's a year later, and they're going to come up against it now with the vaccine. And if you have employees that say, I'm not getting the vaccine, I'd rather work from home, are we as employers prepared for that with our policies and procedures? So when we talk about letting people work from home, that's a great idea. But do we have the proper policies in place? We've been helping employers with telecommuting agreements, work from home safety checklists, so that we as an employer and our clients are prepared and have all the stopgap measures in place to meet all the legal challenges that arise with a remote workforce. So I just mentioned a few here on the slide. How do we know our employees that are working from home and are accessing all of your confidential business information are doing so in a safe environment from an IT perspective? Do we know if they have all the antiviral software in place? Are they running regular scans? Do they even have the proper equipment to be doing this from home 
and the best way to safeguard your business information and to work efficiently. How do we know that? You always want to, in your policy, reserve management's right to actually do a, an IT audit. Have someone from your IT team go to their home and check that they are doing things properly, that they have everything in place. Reserve that right as your employer. What about accessibility of your employees? Maybe you've all been in this situation. You send an email to your employee. You send a voicemail with a question, with a work assignment. You're expecting a return response in a reasonable amount of time. You're not getting it, okay? Is that acceptable? What is the person doing? Are they out walking their dog? Are they out playing in the snow? Are they working? What are they doing? So in these policies that we've been creating, we have accessibility standards. How soon does that employee have to get back to that employer? How soon do you have to respond to that email? How soon, how quickly do you have to respond to that voicemail message? They're working. Yes, they're working remotely, but the standards of work performance are the same as if they were in the office. So you want to make sure your policy addresses those accessibility requirements and always, always reserve your right as the employer to discontinue this teleworking arrangement. As we heard the doctor say, we will win. We will get past this virus. Everyone will be returning back to the workplaces. And you want to have the right to now discontinue your work from home policy and have folks come back in. Couple other things you wanna have in this policy. How about your non-exempt employees? The people entitled to earn overtime if they work more than 40 hours in the work week. Well, we all know people, some of them are working even harder that they've been home because they're working all the time. They're watching TV. They have the computer on their lap, right? They're working. I'm getting emails from people 10, 11 o'clock at night, one o'clock in the morning. But be careful as the employer, if the non-exempt employees are working more than 40 hours in the work week, they have to be paid for that time, right? It's overtime. So now we have to set certain parameters in place that with all due respect, we don't want you working outside your regular scheduled hours of work because we are not authorizing that overtime. So be careful in, in, in what we're doing and the policies we're creating. And how about a safe offsite lo work location? How do we know people are working in a safe environment. We tell them work from home. Well, how do we know the environment they've created at home is safe? Because remember, if that employee trips and falls, maybe they have an extension cord from their computer to the wall and they get up to, to use the restroom or get a file and they fall and they break a hip. Okay? That's gonna potentially be a, work, a worker's compensation situation. They're gonna need now a leave of absence from work, but they created the unsafe situation. So what is your policy? What safety measures do you have in place? Do you have the employees certified? Let's say there's a checklist. All of the things that are important to you as an employer to maintain a safe workplace remotely. So one of the things that we've been helping employers with are a, a offsite work location safety checklist. And it's, a, it's about a page. And it identifies, and I list several of them here on the screen, and in the interest of time, I won't go through them, but you'll have the materials. You want to list all these questions, have the employees answer them and certify that all their answers are true. Now, someone will say, well, wait a minute, a worker's comp claim, isn't that a, a, a no-fault insurance uh, benefit to the employee? Well, it is, but employers have certain defenses, and it, one of them is we have policies and procedures in place, and you knowingly disregarded our policy as to a safe work environment. It could potentially provide that employer some level of legal defense to that claim. Now, when we're considering workplace accommodations for unvaccinated employees, we always have to keep in mind New Jersey's Executive Order 192. Many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with this. It was issued at the end of October, went into effect the first week of November, but it's still in effect. And this was the state's guidelines as to how we're supposed to maintain a safe workplace. And several things that were listed in that executive order, and I, I always suggest, pull it up. You can Google it, read the whole thing. It takes you five minutes, but here are some of the important key aspects of that. It enforced the requirement that employers are requiring the employees to social distance. And we all know it's six feet, right? To prevent that close contact. But if that is not possible, maybe it's a production line and people are standing next to each other. Then there is the mandate that all employees wear masks. 
You also may have to put up barriers to present a shield. So employees, if they're working next to one another. So I've heard our HR professionals on the call say many of their workers are still working remote. They haven't been back at all. How do we prepare our workforce and our workplace for this return to work eventually? And these are some of the things in Executive Order 192 that have to be considered. Thank you for that. Okay. We're at our time. Okay. And, and uh, thank you for you know, the good information you've got in your slides. I'm gonna thank everybody across the board here. Um, uh, Dr. Lebenger, um, thank you so much for sharing the Summit Medical perspective, CityMD perspective. Um, Karen, the, the accommodations you remind us of and, and what we, uh, the sensitivities associated with accommodation. And Mike, all of the great information that, that you're reminding us here, of here. For those of you on the call, the slides are available, um, will be available. Um, special thanks to uh, Mike and the team at Connell Foley for um, their sponsorship of our event today. Um, thanks to our HR group, John, Melissa, Sheldon. Thank you very much for sharing your perspective. Thank you all members of the chamber for your uh, active participation. Good luck uh, as you manage vaccine dis distri distribution. You can see that you've got uh, chamber colleagues right here in the neighborhood who are available to help you uh, should you need it. And uh, let's continue to network across the chamber uh, with our uh, collaborate with our colleagues and together, uh, let's see if we can't manage vaccine distribution that much more effectively. Thank you all so much. Thank our speakers for a great session today. Thanks all for joining us. Uh, good luck with your vaccine distribution. Have a good week. And we look forward to seeing you again at another chamber event sometime soon.